Chapter 10, The Magic Bullet. Always remember that someone, somewhere, is making a product that will make yours obsolete. G.F. Dorio, quoted in Time Magazine, 15 May, 1987. 10.1, Growth. Chapter 4 made a number of comments about inventing and innovating, which we identified as phase 1 of the life cycle process. Phase 2 of the life cycle process involves growing a system. Systems grow because bigger has advantages over smaller. These economies of scale comprise what we call a magic bullet when they work to expand a system. In this chapter, we will comment on the magic bullet with references to cases we have seen to date. The modes discussed in previous chapters started small and successfully scaled upward as markets were expanded and grew. Networks expanded and on-network activities increased resulting in heavy haul railroads, high throughput transit systems, and large barge tows. Filling a network and expanding them at the margins sometimes requires downscaling where success was mixed. The discussions here, as well as in subsequent chapters, consider scalability. Scalability has a with respect to what character. Larger is advantageous if it enables faster, not just line haul speed, but also end-to-end speed, considering access cost, waiting and transfer delays, and so on. Networks enable economies of both speed and frequency. Growth takes off due to magic bullets. The magic bullet describes the feedback between economies of scale, service quality, demand, and cost, which drives the growth of systems. Economies of scale is the property that average costs decrease as throughput or satisfied demand increases. Economists give attention to the economy of scale in relation to firm size. We refer both to that and to economies resulting from the concentration of traffic on routes, sometimes called economies of density. Cost reductions may be kept as profits by the service provider in an uncompetitive situation. In a competitive market, economies of scale return to users either as price reductions or service quality improvements, allowing users to upgrade. On a freight rail link, for example, the more the traffic, the less the cost of movement and the better the service, at least until congestion sets in. For freight and passenger services, network externalities may also emerge, wherein the system is more valuable the more people who use it. 500 people want to ride a train each day from Minneapolis to Chicago, there will be one train. If 5,000 people want to ride the train, there will be 10, meaning the trains will be more frequent, once every 2.4 hours instead of once every 24, so that my value of the trip increases as I have less schedule delay. The desired arrival time is closer to the actual arrival time. For any technology, learning, adaptation, and borrowing drive down costs and improve quality as new techniques are developed, perfected, and applied. These learning curves are not strictly, in the economist's sense, scale economies, but they operate the same way, especially in the early years of deployment. Learning increases with output, as there are more and more opportunities to perfect the system. There are lots of ifs about that generalization. Networks, especially fixed networks, can respond only in the long run, so sudden changes are hard to deal with. For example, a sharp rise in traffic on a rail route will create congestion and impair service quality. That's been the case in the United States, in those years when exports of farm products and coal soared. But where there are gradual increases in demand, adjustments to hard and soft technology can be made more easily, and the links work better and better. So there are opportunities to combine new technologies with investments that yield scale economies, as shown in the figure. Increased use yields economies of scale. Economies of scale allow the use of product quality improving technologies and lower the per-use cost of existing technologies. The improved quality yields increased system use. Higher costs would decrease system use. Ten point three. Standardization enables magic bullets, but thwarts innovation. Christensen's 2012 model suggests that there are three types of innovations that capitalists may invest in. Empowering which take elite products and transform them to the mass market, sustaining, which replaces old products with new, and efficiency innovations, which reduce costs and drive what we call the magic bullet. As a system transitions from youth to maturity, both product and process of production technology standardize. Standards tend to thwart improvements that can be obtained from hard and soft technological changes, and product improvements come largely from returns to scale. Improvements also result from large market-derived opportunities to provide variations on services or products tailored to market niches, specialization to market niches. 
Today's transportation systems are standardized and pretty well deployed. To compete, an organization may locate and satisfy market niches by tailoring products so long as it can be done with a more or less standardized technology. The many models of automobiles are examples of market niche tailoring. There is another option. Strive for a big marginal gain, reduction in cost or improvement in product quality by combining scale economies with quality enhancing new technology. Combining is the important word for standing alone, neither scale nor quality enhancing technology has much to offer. With respect to scale, reductions in cost can be achieved by serving more customers, but many systems have gone that route and as systems reach maturity, there is not much room for more cost reduction. The market is saturated. Though saturated, markets are still increasing with wealth and population, and there are thus some options to achieve more economies of scale. Quality enhancing technology has been strived for too, but often only marginal things can be done absent the spreading of costs over larger markets. Ten point four. Purported magic bullets are sometimes tragic bullets. The magic bullet has been framed as combining quality enhancing technologies with economies of scale. That's one point on a continuum of options. At one extreme, improved quality can result just from scale. The quality improvement from more frequent service is an example. At another extreme, improved quality can be derived from technology alone. We have stressed the combining case because that seems to be the usual one. The extreme cases represent options already pretty much taken up by mature systems, as mentioned. The combination of quality enhancing technologies can be targeted on a market niche. We are not the first ones to find that magic bullet. Wonderful things could be done if there were just enough system use. We've had many policy experiences where promoters put forth policies to steer users to systems so that wonderful things could be done to improve their quality. For example, we've heard many times that if policy would restrict air travel along the Northeast Corridor between Boston and Washington, then wonderful train service would evolve. Service would improve because of higher schedule frequencies and from investments in quality enhancing technologies. Magic bullet proposals are very risky. To make a difference that's more than marginal, significant capital must be invested. If the technology doesn't work just right, quality improvements aren't there, costs are underestimated, and if ridership is overestimated, there can be a disaster. The planner must be very careful. The high risk of blatant disasters is a feature of magic bullet efforts, and that point has been made. Yet there is a larger risk, the risk of disasters that aren't blatant. We now attempt to develop this idea. This requires considerations of the development paths created by magic bullet solutions, the hidden character of some disasters and effects of concentrating system use. Consider the returns from system improvements that history tells us about. Early in the life of a new system, it may be two times as efficient as previous systems. As it grows, takes on new functions, and achieves economies of scale, its improvements run in order of magnitude, and there are large off-system gains. Even so, Consideration of pathways for development raises the question of whether magic bullet type actions are a desirable way to go. Even if an endeavor is successful, it is on a path that mines out opportunities in a mature system rather than opening a new path of much greater potential. It's not getting the factor of two improvements over previous services, and it doesn't hold out promise for order of magnitude improvements in large off-system gains. Just because there are economies of scale to a point does not imply economies of scale at all points. Unlike Fulton Steamboat, Brunel seems to have overshot, so to speak, in sizing the Great Eastern. We don't know exactly why it wasn't a success, not enough passengers too long a turnaround time in port. Yet for some reason, it didn't fit the market situation. Even so, the kinds of ships imagined by Brunel were successful in liner trades. The Great Eastern was too soon. What about his 2.1 meter gauge railroad? It was too late to establish the standard and obtain economies of scale. By logic copying, English railroads had already committed to standard gauge, a bandwagon effect and networking requirements forced Brunel to join. Other examples support the claim. The clipper ship era is interesting. Long a leader in maritime services, U.S. operators bet on the clipper ship over emerging steam and steel hull technology. Clipper ships offered fast service compared to previous sailing ships, and their use was targeted on markets where they soon dominated. The clipper ship was a magic bullet in the sense that we have used the term, and it was a rousing success for a short period of time. But British operators bet on steam propulsion and metal hulls and the soft technologies that match them. They got on a takeoff path that displaced the clipper ships. U.S. operators gave up clipper ships and got on the steam path too late. 
U.S. maritime services have never regained the momentum they lost. This raises another issue about magic bullets. They run the risk of technological obsolescence and are very much at risk for loss of scale economies, which may turn a seeming success into a massive failure. The general rule was given in the chapter's opening quote. We have discussed the clipper ship sailing in the sunshine of its obsolescence. There are many other examples, such as the quick obsolescence of high tech, fast passenger trains of the 1950s that were pushed aside by air service. The wrong path discussion is very value laden. Benefits from magic bullet actions accrue in a short time frame. Their costs are in some unknown future. Our view is that we would be better to privilege actions that open up new and rewarding paths stemming from our ethical stance. We highly value creating options for the future. There is another value-oriented thought. Capturing scale economies usually concentrate service and off-system benefits and costs. Air, ocean liner, and rail operators have captured scale economies by concentrating service on particular routes and terminals. Those who are in the right places have many advantages from such concentrated services. Those elsewhere are relatively disadvantaged. There is a horizontal spatial equity problem. It is one thing to observe that in the aggregate, everyone is better off. The distribution of gains is another matter. There can be another downside. Externalities are concentrated, as those who live close to high-density coal routes, highways, or large airports are quick to remark. To summarize, it's certainly true that many of the improvements in systems are scale-derived. That's especially the case as technologies are standardized and grow to maturity. The points made above stress that there is a downside too. In today's situation, we are dealing with mature systems, and there may be traps when economy of scale-based improvements are sought. Ten point five. The trajectory of magic bullets are difficult to alter. Intervention can slow down or speed up the temporal pace or realization of system development. Intervention to affect the rate of deployment are consequential, for impacts running for decades may be involved. This is particularly true for imitators. Evidence is the second country deploys faster than the first country because a lot of questions are answered and the path is clear. The public sector may be able to gather the capital and resources to accelerate this. The interventions, actions going against the tide, so to speak, to be treated here are by no means exceptional. We can find similar efforts from time to time in all the modes. In the transit case, for example, there was extensive planning and investment in subway improvements serving central business districts during the 1930s. Its purpose was to reverse the erosion of transit ridership associated with the decentralized of activities from the CBD. National airport planning and investment programs have attempted to steer the development of the U.S. transportation system by decentralizing service. Further, countries can slow deployment of unwanted technologies. During the early decades of the 20th century, European nations and Japan attempted to intervene in the growth of automobilization using taxation schemes and by restricting the development of infrastructure. Many countries today still impose taxes and regulations on cars, at least nominally, to address environmental and congestion effects. There's surely some revenue transfers involved. Interventions are summarized in the table. Accelerating growth makes it go faster. Breaking growth makes it go slower. Breaking decline aims to arrest or reverse direction. Accelerating decline aims to put it out of its misery sooner. To extend the metaphor, we think of these interventions as changing the medium through which the magic bullet moves. Bullets slow in traveling through media with greater drag than air, like water. Interventions can coordinate between disjoint actors. We think of two situations where intervening in within system decision making can be successful. Systems behave disjointly. Intervention has forced joint action by components, actions that might not have occurred if matters had been left to run their course. Left to equipment owners and operators, for example, weight limits on trucks would not have been planned and implemented. Systems generate externalities. There has been successful intervention to reduce noise emissions from aircraft and trucks, for instance. Hardening implies interventions may be inconsequential. Intervention can counter system decision-making behavior in the accomplishment of things that aren't very consequential. This statement needs tempering. The record seems to say that it becomes more and more difficult to counter system behavior as systems age. Early on, systems are clay-like and more consequential things can be done. As time goes by, their features harden. They become more like bricks. Notably, policy and regulation are reactive systems and so tend to intervene in the later stages of markets, limiting the consequences of their intervention.
speed enables specialization. Users of systems choose based on better, faster, cheaper service attributes, and how such attributes change as size increases, decreases, is at issue. Speed is one of the most important attributes. As we learned in algebra class, distance equals speed times time. If I increase speed, I either lower my travel time or increase my travel distance. Speeds of technologies have risen significantly over the past centuries, since at least the Industrial Revolution. Speeds of modes have been getting successively faster, and while a particular technology may have an upper limit soon, it seems to happen every 50 years or so, and by the graph we are due, a new faster technology will come along. This is illustrated in the figure, which primarily considers long distance modes. We can draw an envelope, which may be a macroscopic S-curve for all transport modes, which is either continuing to rise if rocket or other high-speed transport takes off for transport rather than just exploration, or leveling off if the jet plane is the practical upper limit. And the Concorde story told in Chapter 12 would seem to indicate that air transport is not getting faster anytime soon. These changes in short-distance transport are not as stark. We can take out the fast air and slow maritime modes, yet clearly the auto is faster than the horse-drawn carriage, which was faster than the pedestrian. Similarly, the Washington, D.C. Metro is faster than the Twin Cities Rapid Transit streetcar. We observe that the speed gains over time are leading primarily not to travel time savings, but rather to distance increases. If there is not quite a travel time budget, there is still a tendency that should be noted. We discuss this further in Section 24.5. The ability to cover a longer distance enables greater access to the country, parks and farms, and larger yards. This increase in speed has been reshaping urban regions for over a century starting first with transit. The changes in speed are also among the dominant factors in mode choice. Chapter 14 notes that in the United States, passengers for transit modes declined steadily from 1920 until near the end of the 20th century and have been flat since. One reason is rising income enables people to buy cars, but the reason people want to buy cars is that they are faster. At best, rail transit or bus rapid transit, bus on HOV lanes, are faster in the very specific corridor they serve. But unless travelers have their origin and destination on top of that corridor, it is likely that the cost to access and egress the transit system will be high. In contrast, cars are parked at home, and for the vast majority of US residents at least, can be parked very close to the final destination. Time, which includes time in vehicle as well as access, egress, and waiting time, is the main measure of convenience and is central to all travel choices. It explains some of the difficulties with getting people to carpool. If individuals have different home or work locations, a carpool requires at least one of the parties to go out of their way to pick up or drop off another. The time savings on the long haul part of the trip must be significant to overcome this inconvenience. The simplest explanation one can give for the need for speed is that value of time is proportional to income. As incomes rise, the disutility of time expended in travel is greater. Travelers need speed to decrease the time wasted in travel. Similar reasons apply to freight transport. Higher valued goods, just-in-time inventory systems, and higher real wages to vehicle operators are manifestations of the issue. Such explanations are quite satisfactory to many. They are simple and that's a virtue. They also allow the analyst to go one step backward in the reasoning. In the case of the value of the individual's time, for example, one can cite the relations between the wage rate and the value of time reasons for higher real wages, and so on. Yet speed is being consumed not in time savings, but in distance. The trend is toward lower residential densities within cities at regional scales and at sites of activities. We see more space consumption per person, both at home and at work. Perhaps the better explanation is that specialization of activities in places is enabled by higher speeds. Specialization is a source of higher incomes. So there's a magic bullet like positive feedback loop. Specialization increases income, leading to higher speeds, enabling more specialization, as seen in the figure. This loop, while positive, is not exponential. Rather, it may have limits. Consider the marginal velocity gain early automobiles gave over horse-drawn vehicles, say from 8 to 24 kilometers per hour. That 16 kilometer hour added to, say, 88 kilometers per hour hardly compares in the magnitude of relatives. But we also observe that there is a geometric relationship at work. In simple form, we observe that the increased quantity of space accessible as the radius of a circle is increased. Here we would think of the radius defined by velocity. How far can we travel in some amount of time? As Euclidean speed tripled from 8 to 24 kilometers per hour, 
Time spent traveling one kilometer dropped five minutes from 7.5 to 2.5 minutes. Alternatively, in 7.5 minutes, when we triple speed, we move from being able to reach one pi kilometer squared to nine pi kilometer squared. If densities are uniform, we can reach nine times as many things when we triple speed. This enables huge specializations and allows metropolitan areas to serve many more people in a reasonable amount of time. As speed increases 16 kilometers per hour from 88 kilometers per hour to 104 kilometers per hour, the time drops for a one kilometer trip from 41 seconds to 35 seconds, a mere 6.3 seconds, which hardly seems worth discussing. Though a time savings of 6.3 seconds per vehicle still sounds small, it adds up to 175 person hours a day, or 7.3 person days per day, on a busy road with 100,000 cars per day. The lives of 7.3 persons per day at a value of life of about $3 million suggests the speed hike is saving in economic terms $21 million. Alternatively, at a $10 per hour value of time, the speed increase saves $1,750 per day, or $638,750 per year, or $19,157,000 over 30 years with 0% interest rates. Those numbers might be worth talking about, but whether small values of time are additive in such a fashion is a controversial question in transport economics, though most practice does add them. In brief, since time is likely the dominant benefit, if the project saves 6.3 seconds per vehicle costs, much less than $19 million, it is probably worthwhile. But if it costs much more, it probably isn't. Ezra Hauer has an interesting paper comparing value of time and value of life. Can one estimate the value of life, or is it better to be dead than stuck in traffic? There are diminishing returns to a positive feedback loop, and they may be at work at the urban scale. Now consider the problem of structuring causality. We could just as soon say that higher velocities result from the desire to use more space as to say that they result from higher incomes. Further, we could tie the specialization trend to either of the bases for causal reasoning. What is the bottom line from this discussion? We need to engage in empirical work exploring causal models. That work would make a difference in practical affairs and could guide planning. Suppose we want to engage in research tied to the higher velocity trend. We have some alternative technologies in mind, for example, using high speed rail as one building block in a system, or using high velocity automobiles as a building block for another system. What to do? Unless we can be wise about causes of the velocity trend, there is little to guide us. If it is more space that is at issue, then perhaps line haul velocities are not as important as collector distributor ones. That is, we want to make our areas that can be accessed work more like circles, reducing the circuity so the ratio of network distances to Euclidean distance is closer to 1.0. If the issue is the higher value of time, then we might want to look at some places where velocities are low and where marginal changes will make a big difference, a difference like that the Model T made over horse systems. Eliminating waiting in the system, places where the speed is zero, is a good place to start. Making waiting or in-vehicle time productive with the use of, for example, mobile computing and transit or self-driving vehicles is another potential direction, so the value of time lost while traveling is diminished since time in motion can be almost as productive as time at the destination. Deregulation, increased specialization of transport services and developments in communications and control are enabling changes in procurement and distribution to which we have attached words such as just-in-time manufacturing. Deregulation has been important because shippers and customers can now bargain with transport carriers and suppliers. Logistics managers consider inventory costs, size of shipment, and many other things. As with any transport changes, there are two impacts. The first is the reduced logistics costs, doing the same things faster and cheaper. The second is the improved quality, resulting from an increased variety of goods and services offered by both being able to reach new markets and being able to do new things. The explosion of logistics activities and the reshaping of the, the occasion serves as a model for changes in the way people live and work. Our discussion above described schedules in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. The status and future of such scheduled living is at question because of the changing nature of work, improved communication, and other things. The requirement to work, play, learn at an appointed time and place lessens as intellectual capital replaces physical capital as the standard. The web and the wireless are much less cruel taskmasters than the factory in the field. As life in the advanced countries becomes more flexible, the rigor of the weekday becomes weakened, and 
the schedule flexibility of the weekend becomes the daily norm. Freedom is achieved when citizens regain control of their schedules. There is an important corollary. Freedom is lost when schedules are tightened. Ten point five. The trajectory of magic bullets are difficult to alter. Intervention can slow down or speed up the temporal pace or realization of system development. Intervention to affect the rate of deployment are consequential, for impacts running for decades may be involved. This is particularly true for imitators. Evidence is the second country deploys faster than the first country because a lot of questions are answered and the path is clear. The public sector may be able to gather the capital and resources to accelerate this. The interventions, actions going against the tide, so to speak, to be treated here are by no means exceptional. We can find similar efforts from time to time in all the modes. In the transit case, for example, there was extensive planning and investment in subway improvements serving central business districts during the 1930s. Its purpose was to reverse the erosion of transit ridership associated with the decentralization of activities from the CBD. National airport planning and investment programs have attempted to steer the development of the U.S. transportation system by decentralizing service. Further, countries can slow deployment of unwanted technologies. During the early decades of the 20th century, European nations and Japan attempted to intervene in the growth of automobilization using taxation schemes and by restricting the development of infrastructure. Many countries today still impose taxes and regulations on cars, at least nominally, to address environmental and congestion effects. There's surely some revenue transfers involved. Interventions are summarized in the table. Accelerating growth makes it go faster. Breaking growth makes it go slower. Breaking decline aims to arrest or reverse direction. Accelerating decline aims to put it out of its misery sooner. To extend the metaphor, we think of these interventions as changing the medium through which the magic bullet moves. Bullets slow in traveling through media with greater drag than air, like water. Interventions can coordinate between disjoint actors. We think of two situations where intervening in within system decision making can be successful. Systems behave disjointly. Intervention has forced joint action by components, actions that might not have occurred if matters had been left to run their course. Left to equipment owners and operators, for example, weight limits on trucks would not have been planned and implemented. Systems generate externalities. There has been successful intervention to reduce noise emissions from aircraft and trucks, for instance. Hardening implies interventions may be inconsequential. Intervention can counter system decision-making behavior in the accomplishment of things that aren't very consequential. This statement needs tempering. The record seems to say that it becomes more and more difficult to counter system behavior as systems age. Early on, systems are clay-like and more consequential things can be done. As time goes by, their features harden. They become more like bricks. Notably, policy and regulation are reactive systems and so tend to intervene in the later stages of markets limiting the consequences of their intervention. Speed enables specialization. Users of systems choose based on better, faster, cheaper service attributes, and how such attributes change as size increases, decreases, is at issue. Speed is one of the most important attributes. As we learned in algebra class, distance equals speed times time. If I increase speed, I either lower my travel time or increase my travel distance. Speeds of technologies have risen significantly over the past centuries, since at least the Industrial Revolution. Speeds of modes have been getting successively faster, and while a particular technology may have an upper limit soon, it seems to happen every 50 years or so, and by the graph we are due, a new faster technology will come along. This is illustrated in the figure, which primarily considers long distance modes. We can draw an envelope which may be a macroscopic S-curve for all transport modes, which is either continuing to rise if rocket or other high-speed transport takes off for transport rather than just exploration, or leveling off if the jet plane is the practical upper limit. And the Concorde story told in Chapter 12 would seem to indicate that air transport is not getting faster anytime soon. These changes in short-distance transport are not as stark. We can take out the fast air and slow maritime modes, yet clearly the auto is faster than the horse-drawn carriage which was faster than the pedestrian. Similarly, the Washington DC Metro is faster than the Twin Cities rapid transit streetcar. We observe that the speed gains over time are leading primarily not to travel time savings, but rather to distance increases. If there is not quite a travel time budget, 
there is still a tendency that should be noted. We discuss this further in section 24.5. The ability to cover a longer distance enables greater access to the country, parks and farms, and larger yards. This increase in speed has been reshaping urban regions for over a century, starting first with transit. The changes in speed are also among the dominant factors in mode choice. Chapter 14 notes that in the United States, passengers for transit modes declined steadily from 1920 until near the end of the 20th century and have been flat since. One reason is rising income enables people to buy cars, but the reason people want to buy cars is that they are faster. At best, rail transit or bus rapid transit, bus on HOV lanes, are faster in the very specific corridor they serve. But unless travelers have their origin and destination on top of that corridor, it is likely that the cost to access and egress the transit system will be high. In contrast, cars are parked at home, and for the vast majority of U.S. residents at least, can be parked very close to the final destination. Time, which includes time in vehicle as well as access, egress, and waiting time, is the main measure of convenience and is central to all travel choices. It explains some of the difficulties with getting people to carpool. If individuals have different home or work locations, a carpool requires at least one of the parties to go out of their way to pick up or drop off another. The time savings on the long haul part of the trip must be significant to overcome this inconvenience. The simplest explanation one can give for the need for speed is that value of time is proportional to income. As incomes rise, the disutility of time expended in travel is greater. Travelers need speed to decrease the time wasted in travel. Similar reasons apply to freight transport, higher valued goods, just-in-time inventory systems, and higher real wages to vehicle operators are manifestations of the issue. Such explanations are quite satisfactory to many. They are simple and that's a virtue. They also allow the analyst to go one step backward in the reasoning. In the case of the value of the individual's time, for example, one can cite the relations between the wage rate and the value of time, reasons for higher real wages, and so on. Yet speed is being consumed not in time savings, but in distance. The trend is toward lower residential densities within cities at regional scales and at sites of activities. We see more space consumption per person, both at home and at work. Perhaps the better explanation is that specialization of activities in places is enabled by higher speeds. Specialization is a source of higher incomes. So there's a magic bullet like positive feedback loop. Specialization increases income leading to higher speeds enabling more specialization as seen in the figure. This loop, while positive, is not exponential. Rather, it may have limits. Consider the marginal velocity gain early automobiles gave over horse-drawn vehicles, say from 8 to 24 kilometers per hour. That 16 kilometer hour added to, say, 88 kilometers per hour hardly compares in the magnitude of relatives. But we also observe that there is a geometric relationship at work. In simple form, we observe that the increased quantity of space accessible as the radius of a circle is increased. Here we would think of the radius defined by velocity. How far can we travel in some amount of time? As Euclidean speed tripled from 8 to 24 kilometers per hour, time spent traveling one kilometer dropped five minutes from 7.5 to 2.5 minutes. Alternatively, in 7.5 minutes when we triple speed, we move from being able to reach one pi kilometer squared to nine pi kilometers squared. If densities are uniform, we can reach nine times as many things when we triple speed. This enabled huge specializations and allows metropolitan areas to serve many more people in a reasonable amount of time. As speed increases 16 kilometers per hour from 88 kilometers per hour to 104 kilometers per hour, the time drops for a one kilometer trip from 41 seconds to 35 seconds, a mere 6.3 seconds, which hardly seems worth discussing. Though time savings of 6.3 seconds per vehicle still sounds small, it adds up to 175 person hours a day, or 7.3 person days per day, on a busy road with 100,000 cars per day. The lives of 7.3 persons per day at a value of life of about $3 million suggest the speed hike is saving in economic terms $21 million. Alternatively, at a $10 per hour value of time, the speed increase saves $1,750 per day, or $638,750 per year, or $19,157,000 over 30 years with 0% interest rates. Those numbers might be worth talking about, but whether small values of time are additive in such a fashion is a controversial question in transport economics, though most practice does add them. In brief, since time is likely the dominant benefit, if the project saves 6.3 seconds per vehicle costs, much less than $19 million, it is probably worthwhile. 
but if it costs much more, it probably isn't. Ezra Hauer has an interesting paper comparing value of time and value of life. Can one estimate the value of life, or is it better to be dead than stuck in traffic? There are diminishing returns to our positive feedback loop, and they may be at work at the urban scale. Now consider the problem of structuring causality. We could just as soon say that higher velocities result from the desire to use more space as to say that they result from higher incomes. Further, we could tie the specialization trend to either of the bases for causal reasoning. What is the bottom line from this discussion? We need to engage in empirical work exploring causal models. That work would make a difference in practical affairs and could guide planning. Suppose we want to engage in research tied to the higher velocity trend. We have some alternative technologies in mind. For example, using high-speed rail as one building block in a system, or using high-velocity automobiles as a building block for another system. What to do? Unless we can be wise about causes of the velocity trend, there is a little to guide us. If it is more space that is at issue, then perhaps line haul velocities are not as important as collector-distributor ones. That is, we want to make our areas that can be accessed work more like circles, reducing the circuity so the ratio of network distances to Euclidean distance is closer to 1.0. If the issue is the higher value of time, then we might want to look at some places where velocities are low and where marginal changes will make a big difference, a difference like that the Model T made over horse systems. Eliminating weighting in the system, places where the speed is zero, is a good place to start. Making weighting or in-vehicle time productive with the use of, for example, mobile computing and transit or self-driving vehicles is another potential direction, so the value of time lost while traveling is diminished since time in motion can be almost as productive as time at the destination. Deregulation, increased specialization of transport services and developments in communications and control are enabling changes in procurement and distribution to which we have attached words such as just-in-time manufacturing. Deregulation has been important because shippers and customers can now bargain with transport carriers and suppliers. Logistics managers consider inventory costs, size of shipment, and many other things. As with any transport changes, there are two impacts. The first is the reduced logistics cost, doing the same things faster and cheaper. The second is the improved quality, resulting from an increased variety of goods and services offered by both being able to reach new markets and being able to do new things. The explosion of logistics activities and the reshaping of the, the occasion serves as a model for changes in the way people live and work. Our discussion above described schedules in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. The status and future of such scheduled living is at question because of the changing nature of work, improved communication, and other things. The requirement to work, play, learn at an appointed time and place lessens as intellectual capital replaces physical capital as the standard. The web and the wireless are much less cruel taskmasters than the factory in the field. As life in the advanced countries becomes more flexible, the rigor of the weekday becomes weakened and the schedule flexibility of the weekend becomes the daily norm. Freedom is achieved when citizens regain control of their schedules. There is an important corollary. Freedom is lost when schedules are tightened. Ten point seven discussion. Frequency dependence, network externalities, appears when a new technology succeeds because it has been adopted by a large number of users. The classic example is the railway gauge. Standards ensure the ability to communicate and interoperate, but this makes change and innovation more and more difficult. Social learning occurs as individuals short circuit the long, painful development process by copying and help to reinforce standards. Learning by doing has average cost declining with cumulative output. All of this learning is good as it drives the magic bullet. However, it has a cost. As we climb up one mountain, we are farther and farther away from the peak of another mountain. We get locked into one way of doing things and foreclose opportunities. Yet not every potential market is realized. There are many might-have-beens. Would small aircraft like the Ford Flivver have become popular after World War II with sufficient development and overtaking commercial aviation? Could the steam engine have been revived in the automobile with enough concerted investment by automakers? Scalability and associated economy, speed, safety, and economy increases have been treated in a system growth deployment frame. Another scale is introduced when we think of changes to an existing system. How well can an existing service respond to increases or decreases in demand?